when life feels dark. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus' family lived in a dark time for the people of the Lord. They were under the rule of a king named Herod, who governed cruelly. Fearing conspiracy, he had two wives, three sons, and his mother-in-law executed. Mary was told by an angel of the Lord that she would be blessed and give birth to the Son of, Je to the son of God. She would name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. During this time, there was a census when they would count. So she and her husband, Joseph, went to his hometown of Bethlehem and to submit to this. And all the, but all the inns were busy, were full, so they stayed in a stable. Mary gave birth to Jesus, and the star shined in the night sky. The priests were afraid. I mean, the shepherds were, the she as the shepherds were watching their flock, they saw the star, and the angels told them to go to the stable, for the Son of God had been born. And years later, the priest and the priests who had seen the star traveled, and when Jesus was a toddler, they gave the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Even though this was a dark time, Jesus shone his light. Well, this is a story that the kids uh, learned the first day. And many of us, we already know, like when you see this picture, we may see this picture every Christmas when we talk about baby Jesus and everything. And, and I, I got to think that sometimes I take this picture for granted. Have you ever imagined how inconvenient that would be for Jesus leaving the heavenly kingdom to come down to this place. I mean, today we're taking a lot of things that we have for granted. For example, internet. How many of you can live today without Wi-Fi, internet, data, only a couple people? Okay, good for you. But even today, many places, regions in the world, people don't have an access to the internet. Can you believe that? So this is the number of people, like even in India, China, Pakistan, you see all the list goes on. Those are the number of people today who don't have an access to the internet. And I see a couple of hands, you say, that, well, I can live without the internet, but what about this? Can you live without the pure water, clean water? Nobody can live without the pure water. And what would be like, like let's say, all of a sudden, the city, there's a facility, there's something happens, so your tap water is not coming out. What would you do? And even today, many places in the world, the people are having a hard time finding a clean water for their daily lives. You know what? I love mission trips. How many of you like to travel different countries and meet the new people? Yes, right? So I've been to several mission trips, and and, and, and all the mission trips, at the end of the trip, we all cry together. We don't want to leave. And it, it just, it's just very emotional, except one country. Guess what country that was? It was Mongolia. Well, Mongolia is a beautiful country if you go there during the summertime. But if you go there during the wintertime, I mean, I mean, I appreciate this beautiful weather that we have in Southern California. How many of you guys like enjoying the weather today, right? Even during the winter, we don't really get a severe winter uh, storm here. And when I went to Mongolia, this is what it looked like. It's very gray, like every day, there's, there's, you don't really see suns and everything. But the worst part is that the, um, the temperature would go down to minus 30 Fahrenheit, and I never experienced that, that, that coldness in my life. I layered myself up, layered myself up. But like going out to the outside, after 10 minutes, you don't feel your, your, finger, your finger, uh, tip of your fingertips. You don't 
feel your toes. I got two masks, hats, and, and ear cover, and, and, and two gloves, ski pants, two socks, the, the, the ski boots. Still, it was so cold. And that's when I, when I realized how inconvenient living in a, such an environment that I'm not where they used to live. And imagine that. Jesus was born in a barn. I mean, it, it, I mean, if you are like, you think about like cleanliness, like you work in a hospital, nurses, I mean, I mean, can you accept that like a baby is born in a barn right next to these filthy animals? But that's what, that's how Jesus came to this place. And in Mongolia, I mean, we have, you know, poor people, homeless people, and people uh, tend to come to L.A., Hawaii, like when, when they don't have a place to stay. Do you think there are homeless people in Mongolia? Yes or no? Yes. Then during the winter time, when the temperature goes down to minus 30 Fahrenheit, where do they stay? How can they survive? Have you ever imagined that? Do you have any idea how they survive? This is how they survive. They go down to the underground. There's some sort of the pipelines going through the underground and everything. So because of the steam coming out of that, they are always like wet. So when they come out like this, instantly their clothes and everything will get frozen. So imagine that the way Jesus came to this place. Philippians 2, 6 uh, through eight, you know, imagine Jesus now sitting in the wilderness right before he goes on to his mission for 40 days. I mean, nobody wants to stay in the desert out there. He was out there for 40 days. Why? The Bible says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God some, uh, uh, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made a human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to what? Death. Even death on a cross. 2 Corinthians 8.9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus did this for you and me. When people don't get along, live in harmony with each other. Good morning, church. Um, today I have a story about a man named Zach Zacharias, and he was a tax collector. He, he was a very wealthy man, but he liked to take a, a little extra more than he should have to buy extra goods for himself and make himself even richer than he was. But one day he heard that Jesus was coming to town. When Jesus came to town, there was a whole crowd surrounding Jesus. When um, when Jesus there is a whole when there is a whole crowd around Jesus, uh, unfortunately Zacharias was a very short man, but he tried he tried to find some way he could see Jesus himself. So he found a nearby tree and climbed it. And then when he finally got up there, he saw Jesus. When Jesus, Jesus looked up and saw that it was him, he, he, looked, he looked up and said, Zacharias, come down. And when Zacharias did, as he asked, he, Jesus told him to, that he would eat dinner at his house this evening. Then in the evening, when 
when he went to his house, they, uh, they ate. And then when Jesus was talking to Zachariah after, Zacharias, after he, he went out and told the, the citizens that he, would, that he would give back four times as much as he took from them. Thank you. So story of Zechariah, this is, I mean, most of you guys are familiar with. Oh, Zacchaeus. What did I say? Zechariah, sorry, Zacchaeus. The story of Zacchaeus, thank you. You're paying attention. I was testing you guys. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Zacchaeus. Well, I, I, it, it makes me think, why, why did he have to climb up the tree? Why? Just because he was short? Just because he was short so everybody else over there were tall people? He wanted to see Jesus, but second day when people don't get along, right? Right, but the people over there, they didn't practice that. They didn't let shine, you know, let Jesus shine. What did they do? When they saw Zacchaeus, he was like, they were like, oh, I don't like this guy. He's so knowing. He's collecting taxes from us and give it to the Romans. It's not just because he was short, but people who gathered there, they were like, Maybe I'm wrong, but in my opinion, they were literally like blocking him. No, 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 you cannot go through. You cannot go. Through. I'm sure that if there's some little short kids coming, they're like, oh, come here. But then when they saw Zacchaeus, no, you're not going through. No, I'm not going to let you go. So he had to climb up the tree. But who are those people who block Zacchaeus? They're the ones who gather together to see Jesus. Like a church. Are we here to gather together to see Jesus? Yes or no? Yes. But then sometimes I feel like, oh, he's annoying, man. Then I come to, I mean, that guy is like, he's a sinner. Man, he's doing all, kind, oh, he's doing all, the, all kinds of stuff. Man, I don't want to really talk to that guy. I don't want him to be involved with the, the things that we do because, like, we don't like him. We do agree that we, are all, we all come short before the eyes of God, right? Yes or no? But sometimes I may think, but I'm a little bit better sinner than that guy. Right? The people who gather there, in their mind, at least... I'm not selling my country out to the Romans, but you have, you're a traitor, a traitor and I'm not, we're not going to let you see Jesus. And, and, and as we walk our journey, I mean, I see all kinds of age here, you know, and I, I don't know how many of you can say that even from my childhood, I was so mature, I never made any mistake. How many of us can say that? There's a Korean proverb. It says that uh, a fox don't remember their tadpole days. Well, in a Western uh, way of saying there's a French proverb, it says that the, um, it is the old cow's notion that she never was a calf. As a church, this... This really uh, teaches us that when we see some people making childish mistake in their spiritual journey, and sometimes I understand it's unknowing, but what are we supposed to do? Should we block them? Like, oh, you're not, you're not mature enough spiritually to be up there to join the leadership, to join the team. Well, you're just so crazy, like... You know, um, when I was a freshman in college, and I, I, I never wanted to be a pastor, 
but study theology, not because I wanted to be a pastor, but because I wanted to just examine the Bible by my own. And if I'm convinced I stay in the church, if I'm not convinced and I'm leaving the church, that was kind of, you know, what I was going through. So as a freshman year, all the other, my, uh, uh, all of my friends were acting like they're little pastors, but I, I wasn't acting like a pastor at all. And then, and I went to the mission trip to Thailand. This, I was so excited. Just I don't know what I did, but then one of the professors called me out and told me, hey, man, you're going to make a decision. Either you change your behavior or change your major. That hurt. But sometimes we expect people when we see in the church, oh, you rather change your behavior or don't come to church. Right? Scripture says, if someone says, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. You know, we can still love each other while we don't agree to each other, right? Church is not a place, oh, I don't agree with him. I cannot get along with him. No, we can still love each other. Church is a place where people who need Jesus uplift each other, encouraging each other so that we can finish our journey together until we reach to the heaven. So, my beloved, let's not create any more Zacchaeus in this church. When good things happen, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. As Jesus travels to Jerusalem, he asks two disciples to go to a nearby village where they will find a colt that no one has ridden yet tied to a rope. He told them, if the owners of the colt ask the two disciples what they are doing, they shall say, it is for the Lord. They went to the nearby village and told all the people of what Jesus sent them there to do. When they walked into the village, they found the colt that Jesus said they would find. But the old owners of the colt asked them, what are you doing? Then the two disciples responded, It is for the Lord. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they put their coats on it so that he could ride it. When Jesus rode the colt into Jerusalem, everyone was celebrating, putting their coats down on the ground for the colt to walk, and they waved palm branches to Jesus to praise him for all the blessings and miracles he had given them. They shouted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. However, some Pharisees disagreed and said to Jesus, Tell the people to stop saying that. But Jesus said, If I told the people to stop, even the rocks would cry out and be praising me. So you see the picture that Jesus is marching into Jerusalem. And do you know that this is just, just right before his crucifixion? You know, it's interesting because there's so many people who came out cheering for Jesus. And a few days later, where are they? Have you ever thought about that? What, what, what make, would, would make them to flip their position like that easy? So, this day, when Jesus was marching into Jerusalem, they thought that Jesus was going to liberate the Israelites from the Romans. So, they, had some, they, they were expecting something. Okay, if he becomes a king in this place, I'm going to have some benefits and profits, something that I can gain. But then when Jesus is about to get crucified, they realize that, oh, I'm not going to get anything. He's not going to give us anything. It didn't just make them get quiet. 
but it made them very upset. And a lot of times we pray to God, Lord, like a lot of times we pray to God when we need something, right? Yeah, I got to be honest to myself. Yeah, I pray to God when I need something. But then when those things are not given to me, when my life is not going toward the direction that I want to see it, I've heard people saying, even from myself, I'm mad at God. I'm upset at God. The reason why they're there, their, their attention, their, their uh, interest in Jesus was very conditional. And sometimes when, when we come to church, even when we preach the gospel, we could have different motivation. Paul says here in the Bible, Philippians 1, 15 through 17, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from what? Selfish ambition. Not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Well, Paul goes on to say, but in other way, Jesus is preached, so it's a good thing. But if I'm preaching here to you out of self-ambition, so my goal is, you know what, I'm going to work my way up. I'm going, to make, I'm going to use this platform to make myself famous as a good speaker, good preacher, like, so that I can be somewhere, like, you know, more famous, popular, well-known. Well, God will still use my lips to reach out to you because God cares about you listening to me. But at the same time, my soul is not in the right place. Are you following? The crowd, they were there, but their mind was not in the right place. So why is my reason to be here this morning? Am I going to still praise God when, even when the answer to my prayer is not what I want? Whenever I see the picture of the passion of Christ, what he went through. Just remember that Jesus never gave up on you and me when he going through all the sufferings and humiliations because his love for us was unconditional. When people need help, let your good deeds shine so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Good morning, church. Um, today I'll be sharing the story of Philip, the evangelist, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, and the Ethiopian. As the story goes, Philip, one of seven men who were deacons for the early church, was told by one of God's angels to go south of a desert path to Gaza. When he arrived, he found the, an Ethiop, the Ethiopian man, one of wealth and power, trying to interpret the book of Isaiah. Philip asked if the man could understand, but instead he simply replied, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So Philip sat down in the man's chariot to read it and explain the word of, and explain the good news of Jesus. By shining Jesus' light through helping others, Philip was able to make the man rejoice in his name. So let's dig into the scripture talking about this incident here. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So notice here that an angel, supernatural phenomenon happening here. So this desert. So he arose and went. He didn't ask any questions. He obeyed. He just went there. And behold, a man 
of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. So this man was a powerful man. He was in charge of money and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Why did he come to Jerusalem to worship? So notice here that this person already knew about God. So the nations around Israel, through the course of history, they heard about Moses and all that. So they knew about God the Father. So they came, he came to worship God, and he's now returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And this is what the, the Isaiah says. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before a shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth, and his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. So when he got to this text, he got stuck. What is Scripture talking about? Who is like the person as a sheep? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself? Is he talking about Isaiah himself? Or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preaching who? Jesus to him. I told you many nations already knew about God, the Heavenly Father. But they didn't know about Jesus. So now the gospel, the good news, is now preached to other nations about Jesus. Verse 36, now as they went down, to the, went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And he baptized him. Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So this is how the Bible is describing this event. And, and like today, we are dealing with a lot of like some sort of political discussions, and then it, those political elements are coming into the church. And, and I heard people arguing that, you know what, the Bible is racist because it was translated in English in the Western-minded people, and then they brought Christianity to Africa with this English-translated Bible. So uh, the people in Africa, when there is a slavery and everything is happening, they were forced to to uh, abandon their own local religion and accept Christianity. So it was all done under the mind of colonialism. And people argue that, and but this incident, you know, and some people also say, you know, Noah had three sons, and then each son became an became ancestor of each race and everything. Some got more cursed, things like that. But no, here, you know, God right away had this mind, his eyes on the people in Africa. And if you uh, look at this, so Tyndale Bible, the first English translated Bible was written in 1526. The King James Version Bible is written in 1611. But the Ethiopian Bible is nearly 800 years older than King James Version Bible. You can never say that. The Bible is racist. The gospel that was delivered to Africa was racist because it, it was done by colonialism. No. Well, well before, 
far before the King James Version, the Tyndale English, the first English translated Bible, there was Ethiopian Bible. This tells me that God, God cares the people, regardless of your race, regardless of, you know, your ethnic background. And the gospel coming from Africa was not like subculture or, 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 or a substitute of, of this, the, um, the, the colonialism mentality. No. Even in Africa, the Christianity was already preached. People in Africa already believed in Jesus. And this, is, this, this scripture, this incident that, uh, that we see here is a very... Um, Important for us to understand God's love toward everyone. You know, uh, some people ask me, like, do you th- what, what do you think we're going to speak? What kind of language we're going to speak in heaven? Some say Spanish. Some say Chinese. And I, I, I tell them, I don't care what language, like, you know, we're going to speak there. But as long as I can get some Korean food there. <laughs> <laughs> But we're here, you know, in heaven, there's no Spanish culture, there's no um, Anglo culture, there's no Asian culture, there's only one culture, which is heavenly culture. And in this place, we are called to practice the heavenly culture as we all come together worshiping God. When people are sad... Don't let your hearts be troubled. Good morning, church. Today I'll be talking about John 19 through 27, what we learned in VBS yesterday, on our last day. When Jesus was on the cross, both the apostle John and Mary, his mother, were beside him. When Jesus saw them, he spoke to Mary and said to him, said to her, Women, here is your son. And next turned to the apostle whom he dearly loved, John, and said to him, Here is your mother. And from that day on, John took care of Mary as if he was his own mom. Like our quote says, When people are sad, shine Jesus' light. And thank you for listening. Well, I'm not a parent yet, but I can imagine, like, you know, the parents, you know, witnessing their child passing. You know, it's, it's just, it's just going to really break your heart, right? You don't bury your child under the ground. You bury them in your heart. And now Mary is there, and, and we, we see how Jesus cares about this woman, a human. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus' his mother. And his mother's sister, Mary, and the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And pay attention here. And from that hour, that disciple... Took her to he took her to his own home. Notice here that disciples they were asked to take Mary to their home so that the mother doesn't have to witness her son breathing his last breath. This is before Jesus passed away. These small little details. Because imagine like, you know, any human being seeing, I mean, her seeing her son dying from this one of the most horrific execution. I mean, can you imagine the trauma that she would leave with for the rest of her life? And then Jesus is saying, no, don't let her see me passing. Take her away from here. 
He cares when you are going through sufferings, pains, and agonies in your life. It's not like you don't care what I'm going through. Yes, He does care. Only the thing is, the world, the world will hate you as long as you are trying to do the right thing. Scripture says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So world hating you is not something that Jesus can do. Like, yeah, they will hate you. But when those things happen, I care about you. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. The promise is not like, oh, we're not, I'm, not, I'm going to make sure that you're not going to have any trouble. No. You are having troubles. You cry out. You have the broken heart. You are crushed in spirit. But sometimes we expect God, no, I don't, I don't want to be in any trouble. I don't, my heart, I don't want my heart to be crushed. I don't want to cry at all. So when in a situation, like I, have, I, I, I cry. Situations that make me really like break my heart. We ask God, you don't care about me. Yes, he does care about you. The promise here is that the Lord delivers them from all the persecutions, troubles. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in what? In trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And I don't know what you are going through. Charlie Chaplin once says that life is a comedy in a distance, but it is a tragedy in a near distance. I don't know what you are going through in your personal life. Maybe you're smiling here in this morning, but maybe you are crying deep in your side, but God knows what you are going through. Like the same way, even in this excruciating pain, that while he was hanging on the cross, his heart was still on his mother, and his heart today is still with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you in humble adoration for your incredible deliverance in our life. When we are surrounded by darkness and overwhelmed by challenges, you reach out and rescue us. Your love provides comfort, strength, and hope. We are grateful beyond words for your steadfast presence and immense love you pour into our life. Loving God, we lift our voices in thanksgiving for your unfailing love and deliverance. You have shown us time and time again that your love knows no bound. Your grace has carried us through the storms. Your mercy has brought us to a place of victory. We are filled with gratitude for your constant presence, your guidance, and the assurance of your love. We praise you for your deliverance, and we forever grateful for your unending love. Now as we gather as a congregation, recognizing that you have called us to be generous and faithful steward of all that you have given us as we give our tithe and offerings today, we ask for your guidance and wisdom in how these resources should be used. Multiply them, we pray so that they may have a far-reaching impact in building your kingdom. May our giving be a reflection of your grace and love in our lives. Bless each giver and their families abundantly according to your riches and glory. 
in, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.